Chapter 21 The Plague and the Quill Numbers 11, 31 to 35 And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quills from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on this side, and, as it were, a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. And the people stood up all that day, and all that night, and all the next day, and they gathered the quills. He that gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people that lusted. And the people journeyed from Kibroth Hatava unto Hazaroth, and abode at Hazaroth. Numbers 11, 31 to 35. The quail described in these verses was a member of the partridge family which wintered in Africa and still does. In the spring this quail flew to the peninsula and, at least to the beginning of this century, did so in very great numbers. Their annual migration was comparable to that of the passenger pigeons who came into the American Midwest in such great numbers that they broke the branches of trees where they lighted as well as covering the ground. We are told that these particular quills made long flights, always flying with the wind to make it easier to cross the Red Sea. They would land exhausted in huge fluttering heaps and clusters as much as three feet high. These birds came from the south, but according to Psalm 78, 26, they were blown to their place near Israel's encampment by an east wind. Then quails landed on either side of Israel's camp about a day's journey. Since such migrations of birds often darkened the sky, it was readily clear to Israel that they were near. To this day, these quails are easily caught in the Sinai Peninsula at the time of their northward migration. There are various estimates as to how many bushels and Homer then equaled. One thing is clear. Even those who gathered the least had an abundant supply of meat. The birds would be picked clean of their feathers, cleaned, and then dried in the sun. Anyone who has eaten quail knows it to be a prized delicacy. They have Israel, who had wept for meat, now had it, but before they have even chewed it, we were told that God smote the people with a very great plague. Verse 33. The plague came not from the quails, but from God for their ingratitude. Earlier, in Exodus 16.13, we are told of quail lighting around the encampment. On that occasion, there was no curse, as in this incident. The name of this place was called Kibroth Hatava, meaning the graves of lust, or of ungodly desires, greed, and demands of God. We have here a series of providential events or miracles. First, verse 31, the wind brought the quail to precisely where Israel was. They could have landed many miles away. Second, the quails came in great numbers to this particular area instead of spreading out for countless miles. Some scholars claim that the reference to two cubits high, verse 31, refers to the height at which the quail were flying that is, low and close to the ground, and therefore easily caught or clubbed. In either case, we have a providential event. Then, third, this blessing is turned into a curse by God. Where men are ungodly, the Lord will use even blessings to curse them, as in this instance. The people gathered this fat variety of quail for two days, and the intervening night, here indeed was a remarkable windfall that supplied them with meat for a full month. But 
God's gift became his means of judgment. What the people wept and whined for became for many of them death. This was a warning to the survivors, but it was not heeded. The people justified their sins as rightful demands against God. Some have tried to explain away this event, long remembered in Israel's history as a case of food poisoning. But such a naturalistic interpretation does violence to the text. The people had a strong sense of entitlement as God's chosen people. They were supposedly entitled to whatever would best satisfy them. God indeed ruled that they had an entitlement, but it was to death It is a curious fact that there seems to be a very real correlation between ages of tyranny and times of doubt. When people seem ready to view casually the bombing of innocent civilians, the existence of slave labour camps, street crimes and injustice on a great scale in the courts, they are most readily indignant at the thought of God punishing anyone. The rationale behind this is that men, however much they complain, are more ready to tolerate human injustice than God's justice. The reason is a clear one. In a world where major evils escape punishment and justice, men believe that their many sins, petty or great, can go unpunished and unnoticed. I recall a homosexual professor who said cynically to a group of associates while I was in an outer office that justice was the demand of hypocrites Nothing would be more intolerable than a world of public and complete justice. Very few people are that honest. The fact is that most people seem quite content with injustice. It provides them with a more congenial world. However, because God is the creator and Lord over all, his justice eventually and always prevails in time, or in eternity. Because Israel was then God's chosen people, it came upon them more quickly. Both Israel and the church today, by claiming to be God's chosen people, are thus more readily prone to be judged by him. The quail had landed exhausted from the flight, a fact common to some bird migrations. The scene was to Israel like a great windfall from God, Exhausted birds, easy kills, women and children collecting the clubbed birds to pluck and gut them before setting them out to dry, and one and all happy, looking forward to an abundance of meat. They had not been thankful for deliverance from Egypt, nor for the daily miracle of manna. Now God gave them their desire and made it a curse to them. Although the quail are not normally long-distance flyers, they do make this annual migration. Whether going north or south, they land exhausted and are thus easily killed. When killed in numbers, as on this occasion, they are, after being gutted and plucked, salted and then dried in the sun. In Psalm 78, 21-32, we are told of Israel and this judgment, For all this they sinned still, and believed not for his wondrous works. Verse 32 They insisted on seeing God's miracles as natural occurrences, including the manna. In Psalm 106, 13-15, we have another reference to this event. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. The reference here is to a particularly grim curse. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. We live in a time when God has sent leanness into the souls of countless peoples. According to C.J. Eliot, In the expression, the Lord smote the people with a very great plague, verse 33, the words smote and plague are cognate in the Hebrew and refer to pestilence or any epidemic sickness. 
As we have said, this was a supernatural judgment. Such large harvests of quails were common, and no ill effects normally followed. According to Athenaeus, in Egypt, vast numbers of peoples regularly killed and salted the quail for future use. The Israelites obviously had done the same thing while in Egypt, and they quickly responded to the opportunity. It was, in Egypt, an annual and natural event, and they assumed it to be the same on this occasion. Fallen man wants constantly to reduce God's providence to naturalistic events. The reason for this is clear. Nature has no court of judgment, whereas God does. Morgan said of this event, Here a principle emerges which is of perpetual application and importance. It is that there are times when God grants an unwarranted request in order that men may learn through experience the folly of their desires. This sounds good, but it is not a biblical concept. Men do not learn their basic lessons from experience, but from God's grace. Certainly, the later history of Israel shows very clearly that they learn nothing from this experience. It is God, through Moses, who terms this sight, the graves of greed or lust, not Israel. Their sin was their continuing failure to learn from experience. Israel sought its will rather than God's. It paid a price for doing so and it learned nothing from the experience. John Gill, writing some generations ago, noted that in this day in Italy, on the coast of Antium, within a month, in the space of five miles, 10,000 quails were taken every day. According to Pliny, in some parts of Ethiopia, such quail provided the people with enough meat for a year. All this tells us why both Israel of old and commentators today insist on viewing these quail and the plague naturalistically. To do so removes moral responsibility. The plague then just happens, as did the quail. This tells us, too, why the modern concept of historiography is sure to further blindness. In a world where things happen by chance or naturalistically, both meaning and morality are discarded. This is, of course, intentional. In verse 35, we are told that Israel soon journeyed to Hazaroth, which means enclosures or settlements 